All right, thank you for that. Um, so our topic here of discovery and interpretation of variation with associated with human health and disease is obviously pretty broad, and we've covered this in a variety of ways over the last couple of days. And um, I know some people weren't here yesterday, so what I'm gonna do just in, in my couple of slides is kind of frame some of the challenges that we've talked about a lot, some of the solutions um, and issues that were brought up. I think um, Anshul and Dave's presentations will, will try to dive in and propose some specific proposals around those areas. So if we start with just the interpreting of um, disease-associated or health-associated variation, ultimately some of our goals are that we'd like to identify and characterize the function of all regulatory elements, the molecules, genes, as well as isoforms. And one thing that is certainly very important is for us to be able to create knowledge of context specificity of function, that means catalogs, but also that enables us to learn about commonalities and, and be able to model um, or develop predictive models. We've discussed a lot about um, modeling combinatorial effects, and this is gonna be no small feat, as we've heard, um, but we've heard some solu possible solutions to that. So I think the big area for, for these top topics is really the core functional genomics resources to support this kind of variant interpretation. And so um, I've covered these in four, four pieces here. So the functional genomics at scale. We've talked about single cell analysis of human primary cells, um, maybe around 400 human cell types from hundreds to even 1,000 individuals. GTEx has informed us quite a bit about, about sample size and discovery that comes with sample size. Um, we've discussed in some of the subgroups about sampling different developmental and prenatal time points in particular. Um, we've talked about the value of cell lines um, and thinking about as we make these collections and experiments that we consider diverse ancestry. Um, we've talked some about organoids, pros and cons. Um, we haven't really, really gone into that in as much detail as some of the other um, areas, but this was definitely an issue brought up. We're interested in perturbations and with molecular and time-dependent functional readouts. Exactly what those would be are open to debate. Certainly um, the transcriptome um, has, has been discussed um, a lot. Now in terms of um, thinking about how genetic variation fits into function, we've talked about standing genetic variation, synthetic variation, targeted mutational saturation. Um, we've talked about perturbation types a little bit, but some of the areas that, that came up in some of the discussions this week have been um, drugs or the immune system or um, targeted modified regulatory networks, transcription factor DNA binding or RNA binding proteins, um, and, and ultimately validation in model organisms. We've discussed development of novel analytic approaches, so statistics and pre predictive modeling um, for single elements, variants, genes, and then in combinations of those, um, including the genotype environment interactions. We've talked about challenges of data QC and harmonization across these different data types, and um, that's something that we think that an HGRI can play a big role in. Um, some of the approaches require development and strengthening of t technologies, including adapting assays to single cells, being able to do multi-omics on the same cells, and um, genome, epigenome modifying tools were mentioned this morning, but also considering of delivery um, or for some of the perturbations and um, editing types. And then finally, the resources for interoperability, which we've heard a lot about this afternoon. So I'm just going to shift gears back to the, the disease-associated variant discovery. This came out of some of the sessions we had yesterday. And um, one of the discussions, or a few of the points are listed here, so that the majority of sequencing is being done outside of an HGRI, um, and that diverse ancestry is not yet well represented, although that's increasing, and the genome is not yet complete particularly for complex regions, sex chromosomes, and um, including ancestry-specific sequence. And so some of the suggestions that came out of that were technology development for longer read sequencing that can help with some of those difficulties of difficult regions um, and can help with RNA-seq as well, um, and that we should also have pan ancestry reference genomes has been suggested. 
NHGRI could prioritize diversity in terms of ancestry or other um, specific populations, specific types of populations, for example, bottleneck populations. They could prioritize particular diseases um, by current strengths or by relevance to underrepresented communities. Um, so th that's where the ancestry diversity could come in, but also um, diseases where other institutes could share support to, to bring things forward. Um, in terms of samples, I think there's been a lot of discussion about it's really important to have well phenotype samples where possible, but the broad consent is going to be important for many of the things we've discussed here this week. And then finally, just to reiterate this discussion of interoperability, we talked about having a database with genetic variation, the population frequency. I mean, really, this is the database we all wish existed. So <laughs> clinically associated phenotypes, um, all the resources for functional genomic phenotypes linked to model organism function. And the thing that really wasn't in there is also the links to evolution, what's known about them on an evolutionary time point. So um, I think I'll stop there and let Anshul move on to some more specific proposals that work within these suggestions. <laughs>